Okay, we're going to um, go to our last talk of the day. Ron Creel. Ron is uh, out of college, thrust into the high speed and challenging engineering task, design, test, verification, and missile support for the thermal control system of the Apollo lunar roving vehicle. Those who were here yesterday and saw him as part of that will hear this uh, for the second time. My apologies, but <laughs> enhanced. Um, he uh, received the silver, the NASA's the Silver Snoopy Award for his work on that and um, other thermal engineering projects at NASA, Marshall Space Flight Center, including the Laser Geonet Dynamic Satellite, the High Energy Astronomical Observatory, and the X-ray Calibration Test Facility. Um, he had a lot of uh, work in thermal stress analytical work for the Space Shuttle main engine and internal flow components. Then he moved to system engineering and technical assistance on uh, some Star Wars defense projects, including Star Lab laser tracking and pointing, acquiring ballistic targets for the ultraviolet plume instrument uh, on board the low power atmosphere compensation experiment satellite and the brilliant pebbles experiment test program. But we're not talking about that. Thank you, Paul. I'll talk from down here and put my own charts. I'll try to get through this. Uh, you graphic engineering. I appreciate the opportunity to come in here. It's been a cathartic experience to go back and relive this. I have tried to counsel some of the folks that are trying to design rovers now, folks at Carnegie Mellon and others, and uh, trying to generate a little business there too, I guess, in a way. But uh, uh, as you see here, uh, we're going to talk today about what was unique and what did we do back then to design for the lunar surface. It was thrust upon us uh, to do that job. And a lot was learned, and a lot was uh, a lot was accomplished. Uh, uh, as I told some fellows earlier, this was actually a man flight awareness uh, moon tag that sent around to his Boeing and made it up. Different companies would uh, do those little gratuities uh, and a little advertisement. I actually was amazed that General Motors never mar never marketed very much off the rover. General Motors AC Delco division in Santa Barbara helped in the mobility system, and uh, they never really uh, converted into commercials that I ever saw on TV. And uh, I thought it was a natural to do that. So uh, we'll talk now about, uh, I've kind of expanded, this really began as a presentation out in uh, San Diego back in November called Coping with the Harsh Lunar Environment. I've expanded a little bit more for y'all today and talk a little bit more about the mobility system itself too, in addition to the thermal control system. And I'll go through these fairly fast. We'll answer questions though at the end. This was what we finally got, and it was uh, uh, not a long time coming, uh, the, the contract was awarded to a Boeing, I think, in the fall of 69, and they actually, in about 17 months, uh, fully qualified all the systems and uh, delivered the first one to restore it inside the Saturn V about two months before it rolled out to the pad. So it was a, uh, a monumental effort, and uh, we certainly, uh, as Philip talked about the lunar module yesterday, we uh, we didn't take any lead. They gave us comp, comp time. They had to build, they developed a new thing called comp time for that very reason back in those days. But uh, we were young, and uh, most of us, some of us were young. And uh, you can also, one of the details I out yesterday, you can see here, when we talk about dust later on, you can barely, if you're really knowledgeable, you can see the left front fender extension has been knocked off by Commander Scott. He didn't say anything about it, nobody noticed until we got back to the Earth. It wasn't nearly the problem that you're going to see in Apollo 16 and 17, where the rear fender extension was chunked off with a hammer. They put a hammer, but to save time, they put a hammer in the pocket. Then you asked the question, I told the guys yesterday, well, if it happened on Apollo 16, why didn't you not do that on Apollo 17? I can't tell you why, but darn if they didn't do it again on Apollo 17. They did the same darn exact thing. We're suspicious that the fender extension is somewhere in Houston or somewhere from Apollo 15. And well, 17, I have been told where it's at. So uh, they were brought back. They had a nice American flag on there, a nice, uh, nice souvenir. Uh, rough outline, I'm going to talk. Uh, a little bit about mission goals and the thermal environment. I will expand, expand like I told, said about the, uh, the LRV mobility system in addition to the thermal control system. Talk about uh, a sequence of uh, things that were very important. That's uh, component system testing, analytical model development correlation to that test data, and then how we got into mission support, what we found in the actual mission, and some closures, some recommendations that I've come up with here for the folks uh, uh, for the future. Uh, this is a, uh, in my doing, preparing this presentation, I found an old weekly reader type magazine. I, as a young kid back in the late 50s, Sputnik era, had uh, found it was called Current Science and Aviation. 
The issues I found were very enlightening about uh, telecommunication satellites and things like predicting. But this one here shows a hamster's type uh, uh, automatic to do it yourself uh, rover. It also shows a single stage to orbit uh, a lander up there, uh, Bob Love Rogers type. But I thought it was interesting that uh, they were dead, ser dead serious in this, in this little magazine about uh, this early concept of mobility on the moon. There were, uh, uh, some people, some people, uh, this, this cartoon got, got some of the folks in trouble, but uh, this is uh, what we felt at times that we committee engineered. And uh, we had to get, uh, be careful in that mode that you uh, just came up with a bunch of action items and you didn't get to the final result. So this is uh, what we call the uh, committee mobility unit. What we felt sometimes, were there, all the requirements coming in from people raining down on us, that's what we were getting, you know, that this is what you're gonna have for mobility on the moon. There were serious studies done for a decade, a decade before the lunar rover was finally designed, primarily by uh, the uh, folks at General Motors, and yes, that's why they got the main mobility subcontract. And uh, they teamed with Boeing in a very smart move, and uh, that's why we finally got the job done. They're from a very large rover shown in the left-hand corner to an articulated type of six-wheel vehicle, much like the ones you see now, uh, not fully articulated but a uh, single man unit on the bottom right, which is a, what they call the surveyor. And then, of course, the, the real rover uh, on the left hand. That's the Apollo, one, the Apollo 15 rover at the uh, time of delivery. I spent many weeks in uh, Seattle, Kent, Washington. Let's, let's talk about the environment, because working on the moon is, is uh, you're, you're not independent of, of how you get to the moon, what happens along the way. And uh, we were uh, stored inside the, the, uh, the lunar module descent stage. This hold it together, I hold it up, it's still tall. And on the way to the moon, uh, I've got a little rover model that I actually built in there. I told the other folks that uh, I actually built this model so I could try to understand. Uh, we had mission rules about how they were supposed to barbecue the, the, the lunar module, the whole stack was supposed to do a barbecue. Uh, as opposed to the shuttle, it has mostly a bay facing the Earth, I guess they rotate it sometimes, but they have a fixed, fixed orientation. We did a barbecuing to balance out the heating. Uh, supposed to have mission rules, but uh, what you find out is uh, if antennas didn't work or they were working communication issues or whatever, they didn't abide by them. And uh, uh, in Apollo 17, we got to the moon very hot. Uh, and uh, at least though, we did have uh, daily telefaxes they would send from Houston where they would have these orientations, but they were in. If you ever try to work different coordinate systems, each one of those spacecraft had its own coordinate system. And, there, and uh, the data would come in and you had to convert. So I would put my little XY axes on there and I would uh, try to figure out this and that. And then, like I said, on Apollo 17, I told my boss, I said, hey, we got, we got trouble. We got trouble in River City. And uh, so we were a little bit prepared. It gave us a little bit of an edge. Nowadays, uh, uh, well, look at this way. There was no telemeter data from the, from, the, from the rover and you had to derive that attitude, as I said. But uh, we, uh, we got there hot on Apollo 17. But uh, as you see there, we had a whole set of requirements. Additionally, we did testing up there at Grumman uh, with scale models and shock tunnels tests to determine the effect of the, lunar, the descent engine heat. That, that caused us to add a, uh, a blanket underneath. The astronauts had a Capton blanket. First thing they did was out and actually uh, peel off that blanket first thing. It dropped down to the bottom before they started the deployment process. And I also point out here, all the spaceport equipment, the reels of tape I'll talk a little bit about later, everything that helped unfold the rover had to be such that it uh, kept the rover kept in a fairly tight temperature bounds on the way to the moon, and uh, especially the batteries. That deployment process uh, found that uh, trying to automate that and get too fancy, so they, 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 they uh, spun their gears for several months. It was really getting get a little bit alarming on whether they could, they finally got smart and figured out that they couldn't do a totally automatic uh, uh, procedure. The, the dynamics of it was just too complicated. The rover was folded up into like a pie shape. shape. So the wheels were folded together and the back up and the whole front section was folded toward the center and the back section was folded toward the center. And hence, that whole unfolding process to try to make it automated uh, found it, uh, it just didn't work. So they finally worked out a, a slowed down process and ate the time. They said, hey, we'll take 20, 25 minutes, we'll give it to that process. We want to make sure the rover gets out of there, gets out of the lunar module. And uh, so they worked out a system where they had tape reels 
and the astronauts would pull on those tape reels, and they would go through separate, distinct steps as they walk down, wheels would deploy. We had a video today we could show you the actual video on the moon. The picture's not real great, but they have, we have a great amount of separate test units developed, obviously, to do this. Also, had to account for what the lunar module was pitched in any of its axes, up to about 15 degrees. Uh, I think the worst one I ever saw, I think Apollo uh, 14 was about the worst landing as far as pitching. We were fairly level on 15, 16, and 17, um, just a few degrees. And, but as you see, they walk through a process where they pull on these tapes together. And uh, I will say here, what people don't see is the back room. We literally had the qual unit there in Huntsville in a mocked up fold out system like this where we had suited astronauts in Huntsville going through that same tape unreeling, going through every one of those steps in tandem with those guys. That was, that was done. And we set the qual unit up on a rack. The guy got in and he ran the rover on, on the qual unit back there in Huntsville. He just did the same cycles, he did the same switch settings, everything. I'll tell you a little bit about Apollo 16 later about some switch problems. So we finally did get the, the obviously the rover, the fold unfolding did work fairly well. One time one of the saddles did jam up a little bit, but uh, you had the astronaut, had the advantage of the astronaut there, you could tap it and uh, free it. And uh, generally the deployments took 20, 25 minutes on average, all three. Talk a little bit about the rover when it got deployed, when it finally uh, had many fancy systems on it that we didn't think were that fancy at the time. But looking back, I don't know how we got all that stuff on board, still weighed less than 500 pounds. That was a requirement to weigh less than, the, the, the second set of lunar modules, the 15, 16, 17 called the J missions, uh, gave a considerable amount more of stay time consumables and weight for us to, to allow the rover to be carried to the moon at all. So, uh, we, it weighed about 500 pounds. It was about uh, uh, 10 foot long, about four foot high, and uh, had uh, double Ackerman steering, had uh, independent uh, suspension torsion bars, uh, had all the uh, fancy things you'd probably see on a race car, really. But those did add to the mobility and the damping out, the, the capability of letting the astronauts have as smooth a ride as they could. You'll see some of the terrain a little bit later. It was fairly uh, hummocky and uh, a lot of small craters. That's the comment they got back. We got back from them in the, in the review after Apollo 15 that uh, really the rover shouldn't have been any faster than it was. It went about 10 miles an hour max speed. But you turn out, you're up in an unknown terrain and also with lighting conditions, sometimes you're facing the sun for glare and you're uh, uh, going down sun. Down sun, I think, was more of a problem for them than going up sun uh, through the shadows. And uh, dodging uh, little craters would come up and they would have to go through a certain amount of them. Uh, some boulders they had to hit them. There was actual physical damage to the wheels, to the to the wire mesh, uh, the chevron affair, on more than one of the flights, and uh, from hitting rocks. So they they treated it uh, pretty loosely. They they got where they depended upon it, and that they could. They said, hey, uh, we're going to joystick this baby, and we're going to we're going to get with it, get to the science sites, which was uh, we were happy about that. You'll see a T T shaped hand controller. Hand controller went through about four redesign cycles until we finally understood that we were going to build a thing like the astronauts wanted to have the thing work. It took the engineers a good amount of time to realize that, hey, it was going to be like they wanted it to be. And they were the ones going to drive it, so why shouldn't it be like that? So it, uh, it was a very, very fancy uh, T-shaped controller that gave you both uh, steering and gave you uh, power, also gave you braking. As soon as you began to engage the, uh, uh, disengage the power, the brakes were thrown off. So it was all an automatic type system. And uh, as I said, it had double Ackerman steering. All four wheels were uh, man could be manually disengaged. The drive system could be manually disengaged with a tool, or a hook tool that he could have, if he had a problem, the motor burn got hot, uh, he could have disengaged them. He could also disengage either forward or backward steering if he got to that mode. He could also do that, that disengaging through power switching also, uh, powering by different, uh, uh, by different ways. Now, the navigation system was worked out with the astronauts to be a dead reckoning system where they would initialize the navigation system at the lunar module and then they would give them a delta, they'd give them a, a change, they would tell them, hey, I'm, he'd drive a particular course and give him bearing, he'd tell bearing back to the lunar module at all times and also give him the range to the lunar module. So there was still a, there was still some indication from the previous missions that if we had the rover totally fail, you didn't want to be too far out. It kind of works around that you can't be too far out because you've got a time constraint of about a six to seven hour EVA anyway. And you don't want to, you're not going to spend six six hours out of seven driving, obviously. You want to do some science. 
So we typically on a DBA, I think the max they ever did was maybe an hour and a half on driving, maybe an hour and 45 minutes out of a seven hour EBA. They were up there to do science, but they wanted to get to different sites so they could do a variation in science at different sites. And uh, I'll talk more about the thermal control system on the front end, the front end with the, with the battery covers and such. Uh, I told you the dimension is about 10 foot long, about 4 foot high, weighed about 500 pounds, carried more than twice its own weight in the payload, being astronauts and the uh, scientific equipment on the back end. That little swing gate uh, aft pallet, of which they put instruments on. And uh, this, the samples were carried under the seat. Under the seats there were uh, bags, uh, belt, belt, uh, sorry, beta cloth bags, where they would carry the number of samples. People all wonder where they had to carry the rocks back. They were put under the seat. Also, a goodly amount of cameras and things were stored under the seat, and things hanging off everywhere. Uh, they could talk about things ha ha hanging on. A goodly amount of communication equipment, TV cameras, and uh, antennas were hung on to different places. Uh, around the command console, which had the switches, as well as up in the front end where the, uh, the, the high gain antenna was used for the TV picture. Uh, they didn't have real time TV. A little bit, a little bit of real time TV in there when you start off, but it could still keep, the antenna was still focused at the earth. It had to be focused, it had a little sight on top of the antenna to focus it at the earth. That was at stops. So just the TV pictures you saw were at stops when you could focus that high gain antenna. Uh, but it still was a, a thermal interface for us. Uh, got pretty hot, and uh, the TV camera out there, and also had, a, the lunar communication relay unit was actually a portable unit that if the rover had failed, they could always have, they don't make damn sure that they've always got communications back to the man up in orbit above them and back to Houston. Whatever way they have to go to route that communication. You'll see in the transcript a lot of talk about times of working those communications on this circuit or that one, or this antenna. In fact, on Apollo, uh, as a 15, well, I, I, whether it's academic, but the point is, on uh, one of them, the astronaut broke his antenna and had to do a patch inside the lunar module. Uh, the little antenna on the place on the portable life support system and broke it. They, they were very good at doing some patches. I saw you a patch on a fender extension a little bit later. So they, there was a lot of equipment added on, and that got you up to a weight, like I said, of, uh, uh, gosh, uh, 1,600 pounds uh, on the moon operating. Notice a little bit, a little bit of uh, on the wheels. They did have some stripes painted to try to give them some mobility information on Apollo 15. They would have used the hot, the uh, uh, 16 millimeter camera, and one astronaut standing off to the side and drive by and do braking, steering, and uh, Unfortunately, that the, the uh, film cartridge jammed, so we did not get the uh, that mobility down on Apollo 15. They repeated on Apollo 16, but by the time of Apollo 16, it didn't have any effect on the change, uh, changing anything. The, the rover worked great on Apollo 15 anyway, so. Uh, but it would have been, uh, there is the data from Apollo 16, there is a good video, uh, uh, 16 millimeter uh, film, which is pretty good. Shows it bouncing around and kicking up dust. On the moon, on the moon, uh, depending upon your latitude, these curves change a little bit. But uh, we had quite a temperature shift, but take, uh, I over, overlapped on that, the little red dots represent the Mars environment. So we were on the moon is much harsher than in swing than on Mars. Mars does have a cycling too. On the on the moon, you go through 14 day cycles, a 14 day heat up, and then a 14 day super cold soak. And we knew that uh, well, we were working work, work, operate at night, didn't have lights, but we uh, we knew that we, we the, the three mission the three EVAs that they go on were in what we call the morning morning on the moon, and uh, there was a fairly tight band there. We. Uh, where it's limited, my better way to say is probably more limited by the lunar module's capability of staying than, uh, than uh, the rover itself, although we got hot. We got hot even in this period. And I noticed, noticed the different units, this out of the hand, this out of the book from Johnson. We, we were very, very bad about mixing units, apples and oranges. This is centigrade on the left and Fahrenheit on the right. Uh, this is right, these two curves came right out of the same page. And, uh, we did not metrify. We were supposed to metrify for many years, and uh, never did. Still is not. Still not metrified. Uh, people often ask me, uh, "Well, if things ran hot, why couldn't you uh, just park the thing in the shade?" Okay. <laughs> well, it turns out you can't. Yeah, somebody did. But you can't do that because, uh, interesting enough, the uh, the display and control console would uh, would freeze up. Would literally freeze because uh, it's sitting up there like a mast. In the, in, 
So uh, no, we, we designed it so that we knew that a fixed, they would come back, at even either at EDA stops, we would have a particular part just shown on the right side, depending upon what the sun elevation angle was. And that was because, uh, not all entirely driven by us, but somewhat driven by the communications equipment too. They had radiators on their equipment too. We, we worked hand in hand with them to work out the final the way, we, way we drove the rover and parked it. And, uh, then we also had a constraint, uh, we had each, each individual component had its own operating temperature limits shown on the top, but shown down here on the top view of the, of the thermal model of the, of the lunar module in the rover, we uh, had, uh, had to figure out where the shade would be and tell them in the right up there what heading to come back to the rover, what heading to come back and read on their display console to park the rover. Turns out on Apollo 16, we discovered after they parked the first night, went in, that they had parked in, out of the shade but too close to the lunar module. So we did suffer a little bit from on the cool down for that. So for Apollo 17, we uh, revised it and uh, uh, said, hey, uh, guys, park a certain distance away. And uh, it's hard to judge the distance, though, once even from the TV camera uh, when you're sitting there next to the lunar module. So there was lots of different parking constraints, but uh, if anybody ever wonders, no, you could not park in the shade. They did put some batteries, little, little components were put in the, on the lunar pad, on the pads, lunar module pads, at different times, for short periods of time, to, to cool them off. That was done. And, uh, uh, it was very important to, uh, to do, or even though, even though we assumed that, that we would be covered with dust on all the external surfaces that were exposed to the dust, it was still important to do a, uh, every time they come in, weekly they come in to me, I, I probably took a couple hundred different samples over the materials laboratory there at Marshall, and had them do measurements of the solar absorption and the emittance. Uh, it was very important to know what those properties were. And we were somewhat experimenting around with different anodizing processes, uh, primarily for the transportation phase out to the moon. Like I said, we assumed that we would be dust covered once we got to the moon, um, in, in most cases. But even the black anodized faceplate on the control console, we had to uh, uh, meet with a, a certain understanding of uh, space qualified components and space qualified paints. The display console was the central central control area for the astronauts where they powered up the rover, initialized the navigation system, and uh, uh, you see on the side of there is a pitch, a pitch, a pitch, a pitch indicator and a damper which would uh, zero it out, uh, and uh, a warning flag, caution and warning flag uh, for, for uh, temperatures, which they did. We did, he had to luckily, well not luckily, but fortuitously, we were able to predict ahead to him so it was not a surprise to him that uh, they said, hey, guys, you're going you're gonna to see a, a flag here in the next few minutes. So, uh, and that's what they want. They want that constant feedback saying, hey, they want that total knowledge. You can imagine, you're up there on the moon 200,000 miles away. You want to know that you got, you communicate at home, and you've got, got all the procedures, so if an emergency happens, you can get back in that lunar module and we fire that mother off. We heard yesterday a little bit of a story about a, a, a mine freezing up where that they might have had to abort one of the missions and uh, it was very interesting to me that uh, you're all, even on the shuttle, if y'all know there, the shuttle is always geared toward knowing how I can get home within a very short period of time because uh, uh, there's nobody to go up there and rescue you. I mean, we Earth, Earth over the moon. Uh, you see the temperature gauges. Realize here now, we had to deal with uh, crew, the crew. The only data we got from the moon was crew readouts. Crews, stop, when they stopped, they would give us battery temperatures and data, but it was from looking at these gauges. These were aircraft type gauges. Boeing got their aircraft gauges on there. It's a nice application there to develop new gauges. But they, uh, uh, sometimes there was a question of parallax and how the astronauts were viewing them. And it wasn't always consistent between the two astronauts where they were when they viewed them. Sometimes they'd peek around the side, or they, some, it's preferable that they, when they stopped that they did the measurement. But oftentimes they'd forget it or we didn't remind them. They had to come back and peek around. So the, the data has to be viewed somewhat in the, realm of uh, a, uh, it may have some uh, tolerance on it, accuracy. But there was no telemeter data from the rover. It was all read out by the crew. And uh, he had, a, he, had his tor he torqued the gyro and set his initial position, and then uh, he gave him the bearing and the branch of the lunar module at all times. I'll show you a little bit about the mobility system. Uh, as I said, it had uh, a fairly well sprung system of torsion bars shown up at the top. Had a damper, had a shock absorber. Each, each wheel had a shock absorber attached to the motor and uh, with a fluid inside, sealed up system. 
and uh, I variously heard it on the internet on a certain page. I do communicate with a fellow named Eric Jones at Los Alamos, has a, has a page on there called the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. And I was able to, I was able to point him to Vex tell him that Apollo 15 lost a fender. I make a missing of Apollo 15 lost a fender. And uh, then I also, uh, I've been trying to correct him on certain things of, uh, yes, there was shock absorbers on the rover and uh, some other things about the dust behavior. But uh, also, we had a very unique uh, drive system called the Harmonic Drive. This is done by the United Shoe Machinery Company. It's a, it has a wave generator, which has uh, three cams, essentially, inside that turn a flex spline. It also had a very fancy uh, 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 fluorinated carbon, which you now see Crytox was the, was the lubricant in there. That was actually developed for this application. And uh, so it, uh, it created a, uh, the wave generator had a one, quarter, sorry, one quarter horsepower motor on each rover wheel, so a total of only one horsepower, one horsepower for the whole rover. And uh, the harmonic drive, I'll show you inside view, I think it's very interesting detail of the harmonic drive is a constant 80 to 1. So when he turned the, when he pulled down on the, on the, on the gear shift, he was always getting 80 to 1 constant gear ratio. There, weren't any, there wasn't a gearing up system, it was always 80 to 1. It's very responsive. And uh, that shows the flex line up at the top and uh, the outer housing to the wheel of well, and then the uh, wave generator, those actually are cam, they're not, they're not circular, they're elliptical cam type uh, uh, actuators on the inside. I thought it was interesting people see some of the internal guts sometimes. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the thermal control system, which uh, was, was my primary area, although obviously I uh, spent a lot of time working on the mobility system at uh, the various sites. We had a, a philosophy that we were going to uh, uh, have covers on there that the astronauts would open, but then we, during the driving period, all the heat would be stored inside that inside that compartment. And the astronauts would come, open up the covers, and it would be an over over center bimetallic latch that would maintain the covers raised position. You see in the upper upper left hand column, uh, picture, and uh, uh, it worked fairly well. Although I'll talk about the dust uh, interaction uh, a little bit more about the the wax boxes and other uh, fancy things we had inside. The question was asked uh, yesterday, would we have done it differently? Yes, we would have done it differently. We did not have the weight. We would have gone with a totally, in hindsight, we would have gone with a totally closed up system, and not involved the astronauts in thermal control at all. Because uh, we falsely had some test data here in the design of the lunar dust brush that indicated that you could clean the radiators. I'm gonna show you that. No, once you got dust on those radiators, you never got it off and uh, much less the dust on the crewmen themselves and, and everywhere. The dust was uh, pernicious, uh, accentuated by the fact of losing the fender extensions on 16 and 17 that uh, really booster, it did what's called booster tail, that really threw it back up over the heads and uh, really, uh, really showered them with dust. Uh, a little more detail, I won't feel too long. We had special devices in the thermal control system uh, uh, I've shown the left uh, on the nav unit was a wax box and a special uh, thermal strap to strap it, strap it to the, uh, the battery. We used the batteries. Batteries weighed about 60 pounds each. They were a good heat sink. They didn't really generate their own energy that much, as much as they were able to, we were able to strap units to them. We were able to uh, strap uh, the, uh, the gyro on this bottom section. It, it strapped into the second battery, we call the right battery. And on the left side, we strapped the uh, navigation uh, uh, unit in uh, also strapped in between, put a uh, fusible mass tank. These are waxes, icosane and docosane, two different waxes that melt at a different temperature. They essentially store the heat at a, at a constant temperature until you use that phase, until they change phase, their phase change material. And uh, we had two different wax boxes, one on the drive control electronics shown up in the right-hand corner. And uh, we also had special fiberglass mounts to minimize the heat conduction into the rails. And as I spoke before, the battery, uh, where we batteries had four different radiators, and two of them were located on the batteries, and we had this uh, over-center device. Uh, the astronaut had a tool. Uh, I'll show you that only one of the covers ever opened on all, on all uh, nine EVAs. On one, on one of the covers ever closed on its own. It got to cold enough, cool enough to close, uh, the first EVA on Apollo 15. After that, uh, none of them ever did. So astronauts had to go in and uh, physically uh, tip trip that thing over-center. It wasn't that hard to do. Testing, testing was very important, both at the component level or the subsystem level and also at the full up system level. 
show the mobility, what we call the quarter, one quarter mobility system, one whole uh, uh, mobility system, uh, one wheel and uh, drive suspension run over a dynamometer inside a vacuum chamber. And a dynamometer pitched at an angle to stimulate the one sixth gravity with bumps on there, different size bumps per the, uh, so it was a uh, full up test system uh, in thermal vac. And uh, 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 show also the top, the top two pictures show a tub assembly where we sim try to simulate the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the surface temperature uh, and also we had a solar simulator. All these tests had, uh, well, the three on the right had, three, three on the right had uh, uh, solar simulators additionally. This is in the big chamber in uh, Boeing and Kent, Washington, picture on the bottom. For both the qual unit, qual unit went through wider, wider extreme ranges than the acceptance test. That's the philosophy is that you, you have a qualification unit that you use to, to really put through its paces. And it's a philosophy we have. A lot of times you see nowadays prototype prototyping where you do the, a certain amount of testing on spacecraft or whatever and then it does fly. Uh, we had a separate qual unit that went through a full set of much of a very high stress testing. And then there was a minor set of tests done, acceptance tests to prove that you'd, uh, you didn't have bad solder joints or whatever and you could pass the thermal back. But it did all of it have a uh, solar simulation. Also, you see an EMI cone up there on the bottom picture, very concerned with uh, electromagnetic interference for the communication equipment. The Houston provided full up uh, communication units and TVs for the full testing. All this done in about uh, uh, 16 months. Uh, looking back at it, it's an amazing to me. Uh, uh, really, uh, at the same time, there was a considerable amount of testing being done in Mississippi at a place called the Waterways Experiment Station, a Corps of Engineers uh, facility. They have been helping Marshall Space Flight Center do uh, tests to try to determine the locomotion, the, the, the slippage, the uh, traction, uh, and, and they, they do it on car on carousel with uh, with uh, actual dust in there. They even took they took a, a smaller version of this up on KC-135 and did one reduced gravity test. Uh, and also what was shown in the video can't show today, but showed that they did crew ingress and egress tests on, in the KC-135 to test out the seatbelt. Turned out the seatbelt was a little bit tight on Jim Irwin on Apollo 15. That's the only one he had real severe trouble with. Also a little bit doubtful whether they made the thing fast. Oh, it didn't want out. We had seatbelts. The astronauts had seatbelts that they had to fasten. Uh, we had the magic thing called Velcro. Velcro, well, Velcro the space, the Apollo program and the landing on the moon would not have been accomplished without the magic Velcro. Velcro was everywhere. Vel Velcro was on everything. Even the little battery covers I showed you before, they had a Velcro seal. And Crewman had, had a Velcro seal. And you'll see some data, a great amount of data was collected for variation. And uh, we didn't know what the soil was going to be exactly like. They had uh, realized now Apollo, Apollo 11 soil didn't return back until uh, about the time that we were uh, really getting going. But uh, turns out in the modeling, I'm going to show you a little bit later, the modeling was pretty darn accurate. Pretty darn accurate as far as the consumption. And there was a fellow called Dr. Becker at the University of Michigan who is the, the primary uh, uh, frontier man that uh, uh, it's called the Becker model, the Becker model of uh, wheel soil interaction. They did, they found that in doing this program, they learned a lot more about off the road locomotion than they ever known before. This, this pushed the technology of trying to, of having to find out that they have, and uh, doing all these dynamometers. And as I said, a great amount, a great amount of data generated for, the, for our own traction drive system, uh, thrust torque curves, and uh, these were all factored into a bigger model. The electronics folks, the astronautics lab we had, developed an uh, integrated uh, uh, power consumption model, which is important to us on the thermal side of saying, being able to predict a, uh, how much power is consumed. So they had a very, very sophisticated uh, uh, model, modeling method of, uh, uh, from astronaut input all the way through uh, how the batteries uh, in the console that uh, creates heat. And, uh, then predicts what kind of the expected power usage you'll have. They only really used about a third of the power on any one of the missions. Turns out they, uh, the driving was very efficient. The slip percentage was about 10%. In other words, your variation in going straight line to target, 10% wand, you call it wander factor, slippage in the wheels. Uh, interesting point to say that the, the wheels had a, uh, a system, uh, not a laser system, but it had a system that took counts. Uh, but it was only out of one of one of the four. If only one of the four wheels was the one that did the actual counting, which they integrated and came up with the, with the distance. And that's how you, it's just like your speedometer in play. But only one of the four wheels. If we ever lost that four, that one four particular 
mobility system, they wouldn't have gotten the distance information, but we never lost one. Uh, we also did a considerable amount of those, uh, thermal modeling, and both in the uh, chamber, thermal chamber environments and uh, on the lunar surface. These were done with a couple of special tools which have evolved into different names now, but uh, Lockheed had one, uh, the Lohar program, and uh, some people may be familiar with Cinda, which was the big uh, lump parameter thermal analysis, diff finite difference system. They made many models. Models were built first off to uh, correlate the test data. I show a correlation down here on the bottom, uh, done up at Boeing. And uh, then we incorporated some of the Boeing models, some we had done by Teledyne Brown, some we did. And, uh, but uh, this shows uh, that the wax melting. You see the wax melting there during a, during a con fairly constant temperature period and then uh, increasing. So that's a, a thermal damper and a test correlation. That all went into a, what we call the operational thermal model, 177 nodes, 377 conductors, and many thousands of radiation conductors. Radiation conductors take care of ray body factors, shape factors, and reflections. Uh, fairly, uh, I guess one thing to say is that we did have those tools available, and a fairly good belief that we could rely upon those to predict what was going on, what would happen. And it worked out that they were fairly accurate, that physics does work, physics does work. And uh, I did superimpose on here the uh, uh, commemorative stamp put out uh, for the uh, uh, Apollo 15. Uh, notice the postage on there, eight cents. <laughs> and I guess it really, what they say, it has, by, by inflation, it has about equaled it, I guess, over the last 25 years. We're coming up on the 25th anniversary. So uh, they also, we also developed, in addition to, we built four rovers, <clears throat> because at various times there were, there was going to be an Apollo 20 to begin with, it went away, and there was going to be Apollo 19 went away, and 18, but we built four of them. The, uh, the fourth unit was given to Smithsonian. Smithsonian does claim all surplus, they have first claim on all surplus spacecraft from NASA. So the uh, Smithsonian owns the, uh, the, the fourth uh, flight unit. But it was went through all the paces, they, they did all the testing on it, and it was uh, went through all the uh, testing. Quick question. How is this in Michigan? Jackson Space Center, and they have one of your prototypes there. Yeah, there, there are several prototypes, and the Qual unit, the Alabama Space Rocket Center has the Qual unit, and uh, also have the Lunokov, the, the Russian rover engineering unit came through there, and I got to see it finally in, in real life. So, uh, uh, but we did build a uh, one, one G astronaut trainer for those for those fellows that use down at Cape Canaveral, and uh, this was to work out uh, more important to work out the. The equipment stowage on the back, and the, 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 we do we do joint integrated, joint integrated simulations where they would go through all the steps, you know, and put the equipment on, drive a little ways, come out, deploy this, do that, practice everything, practice, 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 and then additionally, uh, get, this was a fairly good representation of the same type uh, of suspension system, although different heat exchangers on there because it was Earth operated, as far as uh, having to deal with the uh, uh, temperatures you see on there, but simulated dust cover openings. And the most of the support, they put big foam, foam pads in there. So the crewmen uh, didn't, didn't actually wear the places, they just wear the basic suit. But the place simulator was a, and it was a, was a, a placed uh, foam pad there in the seat. These look like uh, lawn chairs. The chair, the seats, my wife, when she got to come out and sit on the rover there in Huntsville, she said, why do I get these lawn chairs here? Well, it worked out that they, they worked out they were good enough support. And uh, you didn't need a whole lot more weight, you know, trying to save weight. For mission planning, folks in Houston did have about 20 meter resolution data from the lunar orbiter. And uh, that, uh, I showed Apollo 17 traverses here, but for each mission they would break it down and do a whole lot of committee engineering and, and decide, hey, what's the rough ideals of where we'd like to go on each one of the three EVAs. Now, and it turns out for all three missions, they did follow basically these. They would cut off a station here or there, make some adjustment, but the point is that uh, there was a wide variation in the terrain uh, during each one of these, and uh, they would tell us that so we could correlate back to the uh, power usage models and to the heating models that we had. Additionally, uh, I'll show the only time I'll talk about motor temperatures is to show you that indeed we predicted that the motors would run fairly cool. We only ever had the motors on the rover uh, uh, did not show any indication of temperature until 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Hence. Uh, well, the flag, I'm sorry, the flag would only come on at 400. It didn't come on until about, two, about 200. The astronauts only ever got maybe a 225, 235 degrees Fahrenheit reading. So uh, we, 
And just as we predicted, the motors were very over-designed. Even, obviously, they got fairly well dust covered with dust. But we went through all the qualification, all the mobility system testing, and, had, and gotten that. So this, is a, this kind of shows a little bit of driving at different speeds, how it reflect, would reflect in the uh, motor temperatures predicted. But then you see the final value is what, only 145, 150 Fahrenheit, which would not even register on the rover on that particular EVA, and it didn't when they finally, when they finally did that EVA. A few pictures from the moon, as good as they come out here on the view graph. The uh, pleasure to see the tracks, the tracks in the snow. Uh, these are actually from Apollo 15. Uh, they're, they're a little granular because of the copying process, but the real pictures are much better. Uh, and the bulk of them are uh, black and white, which is good too, because uh, everything most is about black and white, really. But you see, uh, I'm trying to show here the increasing levels of the lunar surface roughness from a smooth Mari, uh, much like Apollo 11. And Apollo 15, you go all the way up to an undulating terrain in the right-hand top to a, uh, what they call a sparse boulder, hummocky field, and then a really, down near the rill, what we call the Hadley Rill, which is Grand Canyon there on the moon, was a really you know, rocky area. They wanted to go down into the rill, but Houston wouldn't let. It was a kind of concern of, could the rover come back up? It was in the early on in the rover program. I think it had been Apollo 17, they might very well have driven down into the canyon. But they built up confidence, you know, that they could uh, get back. They landed fairly close to the rill, they could walk back, but uh, they didn't want to lose it. At times, I mentioned before, the other group that, uh, they did encounter uh, craters that were just right to bog down, to, to bottom out, to bog down. They'd get off, pick her up, on the weight 60 pounds, 65, 70 pounds, they'd pick it up, take it, and uh, move it out, get back on, and uh, keep going. Those things were done. Kind of happens to this happenstance they didn't really get concerned on, you know, they felt good enough. But I guess it was a good sight to see the upper left hand picture when you were coming back, you know, see home, uh, see the lunar module sitting there. Uh, that shows uh, Apollo 15, a fairly uh, mountainous terrain. Apollo 15, 16, and 17 attacked harder sites uh, from, a, from a surface hardness. Well, this shows a great variation in the soil hardness itself from a, a fairly compact in uh, the left-hand corner to a soil that was five, six inches deep on uh, uh, one particular station on Apollo 15. And uh, so a little bit of the rover sitting there by the limb. You see, you see pretty close, even on Apollo 15, they parked pretty close, didn't they? Well, you didn't want to park too far away because they had to get all the equipment out and get it loaded. I mean, and it's a, yeah, a little jump, it's really a jump with those calls. They, de they developed about three or four different modes that you see on there. Single step kind of jump, they talked about that now, later on about the things they developed and the different modes. This I tried to show power consumption, how the modeling uh, finally correlated the, the Apollo uh, 15 the uh, little red dot right where it shows the amp hour reading, as I said, measurements were kind of a little bit uh, into view of my they viewed it. But uh, it consumed about, uh, by the amp hour reading, uh, about 49.4 amp hours. And, but uh, all the models showed about 25-30% higher. Um, this is fairly consistent. And I think the base, when they did this study, did this correlation after the mission, they finally said, hey, 25, 30%, that's pretty darn good. You know? it's, uh, and uh, nobody, nobody did put any emphasis into, uh, uh, there was no mobility analysis after Apollo 16 and 17. You know, funds kept going down, and it was hard enough to get Apollo 16 and 17 launched, much less people to uh, uh, worry about uh, extra analyses when it worked fairly well, very well. Talk about battery temperatures. Uh, uh, Apollo 15, we had a little bit of variation. We didn't, these were pre-mission predictions shown because we didn't have a real-time thermal model, which I'm going to tell you we developed after Apollo 15. We learned that lesson that uh, the big cumbersome thermal model was a uh, hard run. It ran on the UNIVAC 1108, and, uh, uh, which wasn't really very reliable either. Uh, and you had, to, the, the, you had to get priority, bump everybody else off. And uh, even at that, uh, it was just cumbersome. It really wasn't a responsive thermal model. And additionally, the mobility numbers weren't good, so the correlations weren't good during the driving periods. You notice on battery number one, we did get a cover closure, although there may have been some difference in what the really reading was, and maybe a meter error, meter error, because it's supposed to close at the lower temperature. The cover did close on battery number one. Uh, on, on, the, on the first EVA cool down. After the second EVA, though, look here, though, no cool down. In other words, after he's opened the covers the first time, okay, and closed them, 
We didn't get cool down. You're going to see a similar type on Apollo 16. 17 a little bit better because uh, we went down there after, after uh, I'll show Apollo. Uh, well, first let me say, after Apollo 15, I said that their model was too cumbersome. I developed a, uh, a, uh, a real-time model and actually went back and used uh, practice sessions, used Apollo 15 practice sessions to, uh, to uh, practice uh, using that during, uh, for, for real time. Uh, this model was used both for planning purposes and for real time. It became a real uh, helpful tool. Uh, the three except Apollo 17 astronauts did sign my final data sheet that used during the mission for recording data, recorded by hand. You know, we, didn't have, we didn't have a PC. We, we had a separate form where you filled it out. And we ran hundreds of cases during the night of predicting, hey, if, if over the night it cools down to only this amount, and I start out at that, I run through the full EVA and make a prediction, okay? Then during the mission, as they're going along, follow them step by step. They've driven this far, you know, we started driving at this time, we ended driving at this time. These were the bad, the switch settings, the nav was on. There was a certain amount of flexibility as far as switching between the nav system could be switched over to the left side battery. There was, there was that capability was built in. And we did a little bit of that in Apollo 16 when it ran a little bit more, the switching between the batteries. And uh, so we had that real time model, and I did get the astronauts to sign it at the uh, final briefing. So I've got a souvenir. Uh, the uh, Apollo 16, as I said, showed that same type of phenomenon. That after the battery covers were open the first time, we didn't get covered, we didn't get cool down after that. We got, we got the first cool down, but after it was closed the first time. For the second, for the second cool down period, we just didn't get it. And uh, this is, uh, the Apollo 16 crew did not spend a whole lot of time dusting, which is their prerogative. Uh, uh, they called me down, we went to, since we ran hot on Apollo 16, we had to go down to the crew quarters. I told all the folks yesterday that it was, it didn't hit me as being significant personally until I got in the airplane coming back home. I said, my God, because the backup crew, when it, it was a crew that had been on Apollo 16, the flight crew, I was in the crew quarters there, briefing the astronauts. Two men had been to the moon and two men that were going. It, did, it didn't strike me until uh, I was coming home. And then I told them yesterday, trying to convey that to my kids, there's no way that the kids nowadays understand at all about uh, uh, being in the presence of men like that. But the men, the men as the astronauts were there, they, were, they put their pants on just like you and me. They, they were concerned that uh, the, the batteries had run fairly hot on Apollo 16. We'd had to do a little power switching, and uh, they uh, wanted to know what the story was. Part of the story was that we had, had on Apollo 16, we had absorbed supplying all the lunar communication relay, all the telecommunication power was provided by the lunar rover vehicle batteries. That was part of the story. Part of the story, as I said, also was we just, once the covers were open, you exposed it, that the, you could not seal them back well enough. Or uh, additionally, you have to go in there that they would come and brush the covers. They kept, got into a mode where they, they had to brush the lunar communication relay unit in the front end. They kind of, and they were had the our covers open, they would go ahead and brush us too. It was kind of a, that was kind of a vicious thing that, uh, and in China, they, they could not see dust coverage on the radiators that way. Well. They, they could not distinguish that, hey, it's clean or it's dirty. So that's kind of a lesson learned. So Apollo 16, uh, we ran hot, we had to explain it to them. They were cordial, and uh, we got beyond that. And uh, but we, what we got was on Apollo 17, Gene Cernan went to dusting, dusting the covers at every stop, even if he wasn't going to open the covers up. He dusted and dusted and dusted. I, I feel bad that he did all that dusting. We should have had a, a different kind of system. Uh, we did develop a, a model that was fairly uh, accurate, as you can see here. This is a uh, uh, correlation that uh, was right on the money. And on Apollo 17, on the first EVA, we did have, it had, since we landed much hotter, we were supposed to land at about, uh, about 75 degrees temperature. And we were up to about, 90, about 92, 95 when we landed. So we had to uh, plan to open up the covers early in the EVA. And that kept us below hitting the, uh, we kind of adjusted. On Apollo, you, you adapted a philosophy of, certainly on Apollo 17, hey, it was balls out and they were going to get the job done. And the batteries had run hot before and you kind of felt like, hey, we can stretch it. So the upper limit did float a little bit, even into the third EVA. They're running, running fine. Uh, what's the failure modes? Uh, they never actually run a battery. Well, they run a few batteries up 170, 180, where some cells had cracked. So we had a kind of a feeling of where they were, where they were most sensitive. People ask them after the Apollo 15, after each one of them left, what would have happened? Well, the batteries would, have, the cells would have cracked. Uh, ironically enough, on Apollo, uh, Apollo uh, 
15 or 16, one of the two, 15 or 16, they put a, uh, on Apollo 15, for some unknown reason, they wanted to have t TV pictures like long period after they left, where the power went off. After that, after the, you saw the pictures where the, the lunar ascent stage takes off. Well, the TV picture died, I think, a few hours after that, for an unexplained reason. They put a special circuit breaker in after that to make darn sure that they routed the power. And the last thing he did was flip that final switch, you know. So Apollo 16, they got as much picture as they turned out. They actually turned the camera off before it failed. There was kind of a, kind of a thing of a diminishing returns, you know. Uh, you only look at it for a couple of days, you know. Everybody's going to clear out of the Mission Control Center and go home. You know, what, that, you know, what can you do? The, uh, at Ed Fendel, the captain video on Apollo 17, he did an admirable job of, of pre programming the, uh, the escape, the uh, liftoff of the ascent stage. And it was all, he had to do that all ahead of time in a sequence uh, on, the, on his joystick so that you could see that uh, fast moving. It like put rockets out of there when you leave the moon. Uh, one six gravity. Uh, but you can see here on Apollo 17, we did get a little bit better cool down, but still that same basic phenomenon that once you open up the covers and close them the first time, we didn't ever recover. Compounded by the fact of uh, the dust dust everywhere and loss of fender extensions, this is a, uh, they used mats. Uh, he, he, he knocked this fender off uh, during the first EVA, Commander Sermon did, and uh, with, his, with his hammer, as I told him. And uh, so he, they went back inside. He was, he was conscious. We've been down and talked to him. He was darn sure going to do everything he could to make sure his, his other missions were going to be, he's going to accomplish them. We went back inside and took some lunar mats and some little clips and we advised and practiced this back in Huntsville of how, uh, with the crew was involved, of how to fix the uh, fender. And it, these lasted, they started curling up later on, but these, uh, this fender extension with these mats and, and C-clamp type devices did work. So it's an in the field fix that uh, worked really well. I put the real culprit down here as the dust brush. Interestingly enough, on Apollo 16 and 17, they moved, instead of keeping the lunar dust brush, brush back in the back end, they put it on a little pedestal up right by the lunar communication relay unit, right up in the front, right out fully exposed. So uh, I think it was getting dumped on. But, and, and think, of the, think of the dust brush itself. It, it, it dust adheres to it. You can't get the dust off the dust brush itself. So it's, uh, it was a, uh, it was trying to cope with it, but, uh, Unsuccessfully, they had separate lens brushes and had to clean off the lenses on the TV camera. Okay, we also had looked at the uh, remote rovers on uh, Apollo 18 and 19, uh, dual remote rover we called it. Uh, they'd begun studies on that so that when the, the, the philosophy would be astronauts use it during their period, then we leave it and it'd be a remote control rover. So we were talking telepathic rovers even back then, but uh, uh, we didn't get very far. We would have had to go to something with a radioisotope thermogenerator, uh, thermoelectric generator. And also, it would have been surprisingly like the Russian, the Russian Lunokhod. Russian Lunokhod was an amazing device also. It landed in uh, 1971, fall of 71. The first mission it went for about 10 months, I believe. Went through cycle, lunar cycles with a lockup system where they had solar arrays inside. It's like a pressure, it looked like a pressure vessel. They'd open up, up and they'd have solar arrays exposed and they'd get enough energy and they'd close her down and they'd sit there, you have an isotope heater on a little run on a little rail, a little probe. This, uh, this uh, isotope heater would be, would, uh, for the hot hour operation, they'd run it out into the, in the app, and they'd run out the app, it out into the, uh, away from the module itself. Then for nighttime, pull it back inside and had fans. So they did you know, kind of like a pressure cooker thing in there during the lunar night. It was very ingenious. And in fact, uh, the counseling I've done with the folks at Carnegie Mellon, They've gone to what's called a benign isotope system, very similar to this. Use some aerogels and things also to store energy. But uh, the, uh, this is the way to go. The only problem you got right now is to work with the Department of Energy about getting any of these isotopes. Turns out the Russians are the only ones that really have these isotopes available. The Department of Energy is a monumental task to get something approved to use, as you can well imagine. But um, due to concerns about is it gonna, how do you get it launched, is it going to be safe, is it going to crash on somebody. So uh, the Lunokhod was, uh, as I say, were they well ahead? Yes, they were. Ahead. I actually received their document one, uh, one, uh, in the fall of 71 and uh, was amazed at uh, what the system looked at. We were not friendly, did not discuss amongst us back then. Even the Air Force, point out yesterday, the Air Force did not give us good information on, on what they knew about things uh, until it came the time they wanted to sell us use of their chamber up to Oklahoma for testing. Okay. They were about their uh, recommendation closure. 
Uh, I've told folks here, it's all possible to avoid it, but you can't fully avoid it. But you can do everything you can to mitigate the effects. And that means that uh, uh, more important, though, is to me, do uh, have a good, strong program of integrated tests and correlated models. Test, test, test. And uh, then, as we learned, you better develop flexible, real-time models so that you can respond. In our case, we were driven by the astronauts. That drove us a little harder, certainly. But the telerobotic, you don't want the telerobotic ones to get in trouble either. You want to have a, a grasp on the things and keep them from, from getting in trouble. And uh, survival during the lunar night will be especially challenging uh, on the moon. I don't, I'm not fully sure of the exact way of, uh, of uh, enduring that. And uh, finally, I will say that I am developing, uh, I've gone back here and reprogrammed, and developed an internet model, uh, trying to see if there's some, uh, not so much a market out there, but an interest there for folks. Uh, I've gone back and programmed the 1600 line code uh, model, and uh, I'm still dilly-dallying around with the, what way is the best to display, display the data and actually have people run it, as you know, trying to do something interactive on the, on the internet. It's uh, still a challenge to me, but that's one project I'm working on on the side. I thought I'd throw that in there. That, uh, Maybe you call them. Do a search there someday for me here in a few months and see if you find something to call like that. And uh, that's better trying to put a site on there. Just do your search engines. So uh, that's all I got right now. It was a, it was a very challenging program. And uh, look back, I appreciate the opportunity to reminisce here and to uh, think back on those times. It was uh, uh, some, something I learned how we did, but, uh, but we certainly uh, uh, enjoyed it, I think, at the time. You know, it was hard times for everybody. But, um, and uh, it was the real good, when the final program finally died, we, we cried too, you know, but uh, you go on, right, with life. Uh, let's see if you have questions for anybody in particular. Any questions? Oh, yes. Um, it sounds like dust is definitely one of your uh, major challenges. Yeah. Uh, what did you know that We, 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 it's a good question. We, we, we knew ourselves, and it's obviously here, we had dust covers, okay? We didn't know how pernicious it was, and the fact that the brush itself was probably a villain itself. To, 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 we had some ground tests here done in vacuum chambers of different cleaning methods were done in Houston, uh, fixed the folks from the University of Texas, and, but they gave a false indication. You just could not simulate all the variables, the one six gravity and, the, and the, 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 the cohesion. You just can't do some testing. It's probably part of the lesson too. But when your system, your peer pressure about active cleaning, um, felt that those systems uh, were, we really had a weight constraint. A weight constraint would really drive us to the simple approach here of just using a brush. We were right on the weight, ragged edge of the weight bogey. In fact, I think they're really relaxable, and I think it was more like a 470 pound rover to begin with. We went up a little above, right, right at 500. So they, it was, you always had, the managers always have a weight margin in these programs. But you darn, you don't get the weight, the manager's weight problem until it's too, the weight margin until it's too late in the design. They hold back on all these systems. Yes? Yeah. Was it determined why on Apollo 15 during the first EPA was probably a scrimmage and then on Apollo 15? Never fully. No, there was indeed on Apollo 15 when they came out, the front steering did not work. Uh, the only thing I'd say is what the method they used to correct it during the night, and Dave Scott did give credit to the Marshall folks, they did do a little bit of different switching. Uh, I will tell you, on Apollo 16, when we landed, we did have uh, uh, some switches stuck up, stuck, and uh, on Apollo 16 also had indication that the crewman did inadvertently hit the switches one time. We could never simulate what was uh, uh, the failure modes, except for the condition of the astronaut. He had the glove, remember, we got switch guards and all the switches, but still, looks like that the, somebody hit the wrong switch. We had to go through a full-blown full failure mode analysis. And uh, on Apollo 15, they did come back out the second EVA and do some little different switching, and the steering worked. They never, in their, in their, in their report, though, they never could re-simulate that. I told some other folks, uh, after Apollo 16 and the switches, we took switches uh, jammed up because they were cold. We took a rover, folded it up in an army coal chamber, unfolded it, cooled it down all night, and unfolded it, and what do you expect happened? Could not re-simulate those switches jamming up at all. Uh, so uh, even though all they do the, the testing, you still get caught sometimes with a, with a a funny in there, but you try to go, you try to design the flexibility that you can get around, you can work around it. And certainly, hey, if the switches, uh, for us, if the switches uh, were cold and all, you pick the rover up and put them out in the sun. Uh, you, got, you, you, got a little, you get a little, a little bit smart there about how you do things. Uh, or if we had been really, really, really hot, like the end of the second EVA, we might very well have uh, taken the risk and parked it in the shade. 
and, and lift in the shade. That was an option we had, um, but we weren't that hot. It was sort of running hotter than we expected, but we weren't that hot. But, uh, any other questions? Anybody else coming? Hopefully I explained it pretty good. It's the second time we've been through it here for the group, but uh, some of them. I really appreciate the, the chance to tell you all about this. Uh, I was supposed to write this report at the end of the fall. We got into the show and things, and I never did it, so it's, it's good to come to closure here at this time, even 25 years later. Thank you all very much.